Anin. This is Winona LaDuke, Venezi Queen of Genitas, Makwando Dam, Anin Indinoe Magadita, Coloma relatives. I'm here to teach the first round of Indigenous Hemp 101, the new green revolution. And I'm doing this because I'm a hemp farmer and I'm sitting here at my hemp farm on the south side of the White Earth Reservation in Northern Minnesota, Winona's Hemp and Heritage Farm. And, uh, and I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. Now, first, a lot of you signed up for the class and we had our first round last week, but this is our syllabus here. And I just wanna say, you go to Moogle, for all the class information. And you can find that through the Anishinaabe agriculture.org hemp 101. You should all have received something like that. And then you have your weekly syllabus here, you know, and uh, so you should be able to find most of the materials. I'm redoing a lecture from Sunday because uh, from last week, because it was a little bit rough in the technology. So I'm gonna ask you to join me for my first lecture, but just to say that each week we're gonna to try to present you with new people and important issues in indigenous hemp. And so I'm happy to have you with us. And you know, there's some classes that you're gonna have some assignments. We're hoping that you all do like a research paper. There's people from all over the country, actually all over the world in this class. And so you might wanna do a research paper on hemp in your area or just pick something that's, you know, whatever it is, there's a lot of things. And that's what I'm really hoping is that this is a learning class for all of us. And, um, you know, I'm super grateful to be able to be here and visit with you about it. So that's, that's just to say, you know, in the beginning, Akaway, um, this is a little bit about how we're going to start our hemp class. But let me just tell you a little bit about me and hemp. I'm here. And for the past um, six years, I have been growing hemp in the state of Minnesota, what's now in the state of Minnesota. I call it Anishinaabe King, the land to which the people belong. And up here in northern Minnesota for six years, I've been... Uh, growing hemp under a state of Minnesota permit as initially part of the hemp pilot project. And my expertise is really in fiber hemp. That's not the stuff with the THC in it. And we'll talk about that a little bit later down the trail. But I also have a federal hemp permit because my tribe does not have a, a hemp policy. That's the wider tribe does not have a hemp policy. And so I went and did all the FBI tests and checks and bumper, fingerprints. And I got myself a federal hemp permit and a state hemp permit. I'm a fiber hemp grower. And I'm teaching this class because I had to do all kinds of research to figure it out. And in the process, I began understanding the significance of hemp, you know, for the future and for native people and the opportunity it poses. And so that's why I'm teaching this class is to offer what I know, because what I know is that the future is about us all working together. You know, that, that, is, that is how we're going to make a change is you're going to need a lot of friends to change the world and change the course of what's going on. So that's part of this class is to be able to share that. You know, from my own personal history, I talked about my years as a hemp grower here in Minnesota, but I was raised in Southern Oregon, in Ashland, Oregon, which is in the heart of what's known as the Emerald Triangle in the late 70s. And so uh, there was a lot of marijuana and there still is. It's, I think, one of the largest hemp, uh, marijuana growing counties in the country, Jackson County in Southern Oregon. And so, you know, I've been exposed and around hemp for a long time, but I really became uh, just really interested in this plant and what she means um, over the past six years. So this class is about that opportunity, but I wanted to kind of give some acknowledgement to my history in the, in the small world of the, of the hemp economy and the cannabis economy. Um, so listen, I'm going to share some pictures from my PowerPoint here and um, for this class. Let me see how we do this here. Hopefully you can both see me and the, uh, and the PowerPoint like this. Okay, here we go. Tribal Hemp 101. That's this class. This is art by Votan, one of the great artists um, in our indigenous community and um, you know, this is uh, the potential for hemp. And in the world that we are in, you know, hemp is one of the fastest growing um, markets out there across the board, whether it is legalized marijuana or it is the renaissance of hemp. And, and this is an opportunity for tribal people to be not on the menu, but at the table. And in fact, setting tribal hemp policies and controlling our own seeds and controlling the future of hemp as we, as we have it work with this plant to change and make better our future. So Here's a little bit about hemp. This is where I'm at right now, our hemp farm. And um, behind you, me, you see one of our great leaders, um, 
um, from my from my community, Nagani Benes, the leading bird. He's from my community, but he's here at our hemp farm. But our hemp farm on the north side, you can see these pictures. This is me and my grandsons and some other kids. I've been living here for the past two years pretty consistently uh, because of COVID. And you know, I really have been thinking a lot about what Erin Dottie Roy says when she talks about pandemic as portal. It's a portal between one world and the next. She says, in the history of the world, pandemics have also always forced societies to change. And this one is no different. It's the portal between one world and the next. And in this moment, when we've all been living at home and changing how we live and relate, um, I have learned a lot about hemp. And I'm grateful for this time. This is some of my greatest teachers I want to acknowledge at the beginning. And coming to our class, um, Alex Whiteplume, one of the great leaders of the hemp economy and the cannabis economy in Indian country. And uh, he will be lecturing, but he was one of the first in the, in the last century to grow hemp in Indian country and faced a lot of federal charges for it. And this is his yard. And I just wanna say, I went to visit him a few years ago in his yard and that hemp there is all volunteer because hemp, the spirit of volunteerism is very high with hemp. The feds came and seized his crop shook those seeds on the way out. And at the time I took this picture, Alex White Plume could not touch any of the hemp in his yard, but it was very happy to be there. And I also wanna acknowledge John Trudell, uh, who said hemp is the way. And he is the one who told me really for many, many, many years that hemp was really the answer and the solution to so many of the industrial messes that we are in now. And I just wanna acknowledge him because he was part of the teaching, you know, that we, we have had. And, you know, it was said to me and it's, in the Patagonia film, which I refer you to, the, um, it's said by this Kentucky farmer, he said that we had a choice between a carbohydrate economy and a hydrocarbon economy. And we made the wrong choice. The hydrocarbon economy is what we got. The carbohydrate economy was hemp. And this is a story of hemp. And this is a story about hemp into the future, as well as a story of what happened to hemp in kind of a quick overview. Um, but I think about that a lot because in this moment in time, those words are so close, carbohydrate and hydrocarbon. But what we want is a carbohydrate, not a hydrocarbon economy. And that's what this potential is for hemp. So this is a little bit about the difference between hemp. Um, I'm a hemp grower and you can see the primary uses of this are fiber. I'm a fiber hemp grower, which can make, be made into textiles and can be made into um, insulation and various other products that we're going to talk about in this class. And it also can be food and it also can be oil. You know, some of the finest oils are hemp oils. And then there is marijuana. They are the same plant, <laughs> but you know, marijuana has, is far more um, viewed for its medicinal uh, value. And there's two primary medicines that are in marijuana. One is THC and one is CBDs, although there are many more, but this is a little bit more on the descriptions of them, um, I have fields that are hemp and my hemp fields pretty much look like bamboo. They don't look like Christmas trees. And so this kind of like is a, is a difference you can see um, just in this chart from looking at it, like, you know, marijuana plant look kind of like a Christmas tree and, you know, it's gonna test high for CH, uh, CBD and THC, both of them. And it's you know very healing and valuable and legal in some places and not legal in others. I myself don't grow marijuana. I grow hemp and I have uh, kept my hemp under the 0.3% THC limit. And that's a legal designation that separates hemp from marijuana is this 0.3%. Now that 0.3% is what you gotta keep your crop under uh, by all costs, but also you gotta understand that many of these seeds are not stabilized because of the renaissance of the hemp economy. So that's to say that's part of this discussion is where you find seeds that are probably pretty reliable because you don't want your crop to go hot. But in that, the potential uh, for the new green revolution and for the economy that is hemp is immense, whether it is with THC or without THC. So this is a little bit about the history of hemp. This is some Hmong girls harvesting hemp in um, their territory in Laos. And I like this picture because, you know, hemp is not indigenous to North America. You know, it is said that the Tuscarora name, the name for the Tuscarora people in their own language is the people of the hemp shirts. The hemp that they were talking about is known as Indian hemp or dog bane. 
that is this this crop that is known as hemp um, is comes from Asia and it comes from particularly the Pacific and the people with the longest tradition really of hemp uh, use in this form are the Hmong people. And so I wanna give some acknowledgement. This is some of the Hmong skirts um, that are made out of the really amazing hemp and such ornate dyeing and, and, and loom work and handwork with them. And so, you know, I just wanna acknowledge that the people who know most about the hemp are probably the Hmong and uh, their artisan work is really highly regarded. And here's a hemp farmer in Turkey um, as well. You know, the textiles of the hemp economy are pretty widespread in Eastern Europe. Um, you know, here's some Romanian hemp, as you see, um, Turkey um, and Southeast Asia into India. There's many varieties that are grown. I being a Northern person have um, had a lot of interest in the hemp industry, but the processing and growing is a little different if you live in Anishinaabe King, Northern Minnesota. So this is a little bit I wanted to acknowledge that what I'm talking about is not something that is new. <laughs> I'm talking about thousands of years, 10,000 years of hemp in building, in textiles, in foods, in all you know, kinds of materials. And um, you know, so what we are interested in here is making sure in this class and elsewhere that Native people understand about hemp and understand about the history of it and also how to grow it and how to process it. I asked this fellow one time at an agriculture research center in Jackson County, you know, the, the uh, Emerald Triangle. I asked a researcher about teaching hemp classes and he said, there's no such thing as hemp 101, basically because we know so little. If you were teaching hemp 101, you would know all the answers and there'd be multiple choice and there'd be reliable answers to each question not actually true with some of the hemp information. There's so many unknowns because of the criminalization of hemp. And this class is about trying to at least show what we do know and point out a lot of the research needs that we have for hemp in, in not only Indi Indian country, but throughout the world. So this is uh, another picture of uh, Turkish hemp harvesting. And then here's some hemp sales. That's exactly right. The word canvas, the word canvas comes from cannabis, meaning that hemp is the most resilient and reliable textile for use of sales. And if you are crossing the ocean blue in some stage of colonialism, you don't want your sail to fall apart. Hemp is what all of those sails were made of, as well as sadly, all of the hanging ropes were actually required to be hemp in many states. Having said that, um, you know, this is the significance of the industry for thousands of years and certainly in the last 500. This is a little bit about hemp in Minnesota. Now it turns out that Minnesota used to have 11 hemp mills and they were mostly in Southern Minnesota. The last hemp mill in Minnesota was actually in Winona, Minnesota. This hemp production was very successful in Minnesota into the, into the 1930s, until the onset of what um, was known as the uh, Marijuana Tax Act. And that is what largely changed the world. So I'm going to uh, you know, ask these questions of how that happened. In 1916, as you can see, the US government predicted by 1940, all paper would come from hemp and no more trees would need to be cut down because why? An acre of hemp is equal to four acres of trees and it takes a year when it takes 20 years to grow the same amount in trees. So that is the significance of hemp. And those are there were the forces that were behind the criminalization of hemp were very significant in part because of the significance of hemp in challenging the colonial economy. That is to say, if you were a lumber baron like Weyerhaeuser or uh, Congdon or Pillsbury, you might wanna keep the trees and have the value of the trees because hemp totally offset any value you could have. And here's even Henry Ford who talked about making a car out of hemp and also using hemp oil. You know, um, 
hemp was very highly regarded in the early part of the 20th century. This is the guy who criminalized hemp. His name was Henry Anslinger, and he was the first commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. And until the time that hemp had been criminalized, it was used widely as a medicinal for its medicinal value. So, you know, if you think about it, as early as the 1800s, there were no federal restrictions on the sale or possession of cannabis in the US. Hemp fiber from the plant was used to make clothes, paper, and rope. Sometimes it was used medicinally. And, but as a recreational drug, it wasn't widespread. A New York Times article in 1876 cites the positive use of cannabis to cure a patient's dropsy, basically an accumulation of fluid. So a pernicious smear campaign, just a really rotten talk and smack campaign began um, in the 1930s, headed in part by Henry Anslinger and financed by all the lumber barons, all of the rubber barons, all the steel barons, all the paper barons, all of the cotton barons who did not want him to offset the, the profits that they continued to make. So public opinion began to change in the 1930s because of this, this smear campaign, which films like Reefer Madness are largely what we know from that culture in, in ensuring that there was this perception that hemp made you crazy. But in fact, the, the, IG, the fact that hemp um, was criminalized under the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937, that was the first legal uh, criminalization of marijuana. And that largely had to do with racism against Mexicans because a lot of um, cannabis, cannabis had, it was coming in through Mexico. And during the early 1900s, it's an influx of Mexican immigrants come to the US fleeing political unrest in their own country. And they brought the practice of smoking cannabis recreationally. And it took off the Spanish word for the marijuana, for the plant used to be, started to be used more often, marijuana, or as it was spelled in the time, marijuana with an H. Then more and more sensational headlines about the drug started to appear. In the 1936, a propaganda film called Reefer Madness was released. And the movie Teenagers Smoke Weed for the first time and this leads to a series of horrific events involving hallucination, attempted rape and a murder. Much of this, in, it, much of the media portrayed it as a gateway drug. Increasing restrictions of labeling of cannabis as a poison began in many states from 1906 onward and outright prohibitions began in the 1920s. By the mid 1930s, cannabis was regulated as a drug in every state including 35 states that adopted the Uniform State Narcotic, Narcotic Drug Act. The first national regulation was the Marijuana Tax Act of 1837. But it wasn't just in the United States that cannabis was outlawed because the United States was a world power and it used its influence to criminalize cannabis everywhere. Cannabis was outlawed in the United States with the passage Finally, of the Controlled Substances Act and the post-war regulation of Japan, however, the country's hemp industry, much of it tied to shrines and religion, was also outlawed. It's illegal to use or possess cannabis in Japan. The Cannabis Control Act was first introduced in 1948, just after World War II, when the country was occupied by the United States. Under that, all seeds and use of cannabis was, was, in, it was criminalized. More than that, the, the criminalization of cannabis involved what was referred to as a purging of the books by one researcher um, from Canada who, who told me the story. In the 1950s, cannabis information was deleted from a significant amount of federal records in the US and Canada. It's really hard to find any information about the crops. The American Textile Museum, the Smithsonian Institute, and most American history books contain no mention of hemp. The government's war on drugs created an atmosphere of self-censorship where speaking of the hemp in a positive manner was considered politically incorrect or taboo. Canadian law also made it illegal to learn how to even grow hemp, said Jeffrey Keem, a hemp researcher working with AgriLoop. That's who told me that it was entirely criminalized. There's no records of this being a vital industry anywhere in North America. And that's created, it created a mystery for people who were trying to rebuild the industry. It's kind of like that story, who killed the electric car? And then the question is, is who killed the hemp industry? But and where the body go? That's the question that we've been trying to ask. So that is part of the reason of, uh, for this class is because the trying to find the body, trying to find the parts of a hemp industry which flourished in this country at the early part of the 20th century 
is a mystery to all of us. And so, you know, what we understand is, is the loss that we have in terms of the technological knowledge of how to, how to bring this plant into our materials economy. But in addition to that, we lost all knowledge of the medicinal value of hemp and of cannabis. That's to say that as the United States struggles today with the basics of cannabis research, such as providing proper cannabis to researchers at any of the medical dispensaries in this country, other countries have leapt ahead. One of the foremost is Israel, where many in the marijuana field believe is the most innovative research. That's consistently where it's been happening because they've been researching hemp and cannabis for 50 years. Is Israel isn't just at the forefront of medical cannabis research, right? Swiss medical cannabis company, Sibdal. It's out, of, it's out in front by some margin. That's what US News and World Report says, referring to Israel as the holy land of medical marijuana. Most of this research is due to Raphael Mecham, who began researching in 1960 with the support of the Israeli government. What happened next is well known in the marijuana industry. The researchers isolated CBD and THC in marijuana, leading to more research on the psychological and physical impact of both on humans. By the 1990s, there was government-backed research in Israel decades ahead of most other countries. That's how we got left in the dust on cannabis production because of guys like Anslinger. You know, and here's some articles about the evil Mexican plants that will drive you insane going along with the um, with the reefer madness scenario. And then there was the criminalization, which entirely was racist. That's to say, we all know that all kinds of people smoke herb in this country. You know, we could do a study and we find out, oh, that's right. Here you go. Marijuana use 18 to 25 year olds. Oh, it turns out that in this study, which is about 10 years old, white kids, you know, young youth use marijuana more than black kids. But this is what happens. Black times have been nearly four times more likely than whites to be arrested for marijuana possession during the same time. So there's far fewer African-American young people smoking herb than there are white kids, but all this here, the charges are much higher. And uh, in DC, Minnesota, and Illinois, black African-Americans are 7.8 to eight times more likely than whites to be arrested for having weed. Minnesota, the state I live in, is number three in the country for these arrests. Perfect. That's exactly what uh, profiling is, is like. And it's incredible the amount of money. You know, okay, so states wasted $3 billion enforcing marijuana laws every year. You know, this means wasting money that could be better spent on many things in our, in our systems of well-being in our society. And so the criminalization has been very expensive and so... And, and not only for society, but also for all of our societies, our indigenous societies and our African-American societies. You know, in as much as, as African-Americans are far more likely in the state of Minnesota to um, be charged with, criminally with cannabis, the same thing is true in, with Indian people. You know, the only figures I have that are full on, on arrests, Regina, Indian person is nine times more likely than a non-Indian person to be charged with cannabis. That was them. Now with legalization, you know, all of that is changing, you know, but slowly. And Native people are still charged with marijuana possession at a higher rate than non-Native people. But more than that, the problem is, is that with legalization, the people who were the most impacted by criminalization, people of color, are not the owners of the industry as it moves into the hundreds of billions of dollars of recreational and value-added production in hemp and in cannabis. 81% of the owners of marijuana businesses are white. That would leave 19% of it for the rest of us. That is what this class is about, the question of equity in the cannabis industry. With the criminalization, of, of cannabis and then the decriminalization of cannabis, we wanna be sure that the people who are the most impacted are also the people who benefit in this industry. That is, that is as I said, um, what this class is about. And, and in, in later, um, later classrooms, we were gonna have presentations exactly on that to share more about that with you, particularly with Angela Dawson of 40 Acre Co-op. So 
Here's another example of equity in the cannabis industry. This is the Oatman family, three generations of cannabis growers. And um, super honored to be able to have them participate both in our hemp workshop and in our hemp class. So there has been some, some women that have been in the leadership you know, of the cannabis industry. And I want to put my, you know, hands all hands up there to the Oatman family from Nimipu territory, Nez Perce people who have been growing for many years. And uh, then I want to just go a little bit more into what the plant varieties are. So this is what I am focusing on in this class. You know, there will be a class that will have recreational uh, marijuana in it. We will discuss that. That industry is largely developed. The information, whether it is from growing techniques to varieties to, to the markets, fully developed, value-added processing. The industry that I am interested in is the fiber industry. That's what this class is. So you can see some of the things that you can make with fiber hemp. Um, and you can make all of those things. Um, but the processing and the technology, as I said, because of the criminalization of hemp have made it almost uh, entirely Im impossible. It's like a puzzle, kind of like a cold case that you're putting together the pieces, but this is the time and in this class, and as we look around, we see more and more emergent technologies or renovations of technologies and adaptations. And we wanna learn about those things because if I'm gonna go spend a half a million dollars on some equipment, I wanna know the equipment's gonna work. All right, that's what we all need. So this is my field. This is uh, actually a field on the White Earth Reservation near the town of Callaway. And this is a 2015 crop. This is our first year growing. Um, this is my extended family and guys who work with me. And you can see what the fiber hemp looks like. That's, I don't know, seven feet tall. This is a volunteer crop. That's to say that this crop uh, grew, uh, this crop grew on its own. The tribe had been growing and then the tribe not having a hemp policy decided that it was not gonna grow any longer. And since I had a hemp permit, asked if I would be interested in taking over this field. This was foundational uh, to our research here. Um, and this is how we started trying to learn about hemp. So this is my work with um, um, CBD hemp. Just to say that I do grow some CBD varieties. They're grown in our Waganogan or our wigwam style. This is out by my horse pasture. And these are this year's hemp. I believe this is a um, called a Wonder Woman variety that came out of my friend, Angela Dawson at 40 Acre Co-op. Very high quality medicinal hemp varieties. Now, I just want you to, in this class, we are gonna talk about uh, growing techniques, but what you can see is two very separate plants here. These plants are look like Christmas trees. They look like bushes. Um, CBD varieties, this is how I think that they should be grown. I don't think you should grow an entire field of them. I think it's disrespectful to the plant and it diminishes the kind of energy and power that each plant has. I personally believe that, that the CBD varieties that are grown as well as the marijuana varieties, which one day I may grow, um, prefer to be treated like divas. Treat them well. Don't make an assumption, baby them. You know, this uh, variety, a few years ago, I had a, a grower that I, a, a clone daddy, I guess you call him a clone daddy, who I bought seeds from because in this, in the case of CBDs, you really want to make sure that you only buy a clone because nothing is stable. Nothing is stable. So clone daddy, I guess that's what they're called. You know, if you're going to get your clones, you got to get them from someone and so, so that you know that you're growing exactly the plant that is so it won't go hot. And uh, so he came up and he said, uh, he looked at my plants and he was really amazed at our plants, our CBD girls. He said, oh my gosh, he said, those are the furthest north and the largest plants. I said, thank you. You know, so it is to say here in northern Minnesota, you can grow a fine cannabis plant or a fine hemp plant. They like the sun in the summer. They get they got to get started inside. They got to get started as clones. But you know, um, I'm really proud of our growing. They like horse manure and they like to be around horses. And uh, so I'm just saying that. And uh, this is us putting in actually a crop of hemp with some of our horses. This is an Amish field, and my horses are on the left and right side. They're the smaller um, halflingers, 
And the horses in the middle are the Amish horses. And this is my uh, a seed drill and he is actually putting in my hemp here with his horses. So this is how we were growing field hemp. We grow, as I said, the CBDs, but our field hemp varieties. And, and when you grow them, you've got to plant them close together. So you use a seed drill or else you can uh, broadcast them. But we'll talk about that in the later classes. Now, when you harvest, this is what you want it to look like. Now you could see my wigwam there on the left where I have not unlike the Hmong farmers, cut the hemp, took off the heads, which would be the seed heads. And then I lean it up against my cool um, wigwam. This is a friend of mine's, uh, Eric Nochi, who's near uh, St. Cloud, Minnesota, south of St. Cloud, Minnesota. And he uh, married to a Japanese hemp grower, artisan hemp grower, grew this hemp for his wife, processed similarly into a high end, like the, like the Hmong do a high end textile variety. And this is Don Wadel working on this hemp, uh, doing exactly the same thing that he learned. He's parboiling it in this um, boiler. And then it seems to set the biodegrading, stop the biodegrading and keep the fiber in a good quality. Um, so we, you know, we're, we're testing out here at the farm I'm on, the Anishinaabe Agriculture Farm, we're tax exempt 501c3. And we are interested in doing research in not only the varieties of hemp, you know, seeing which ones are good to grow in our territory, good grow in dryer, maybe good grow for seed, but also in the processing. And so this is us doing artisan processing, you know, of our hemp. And then this is us doing not artisan processing of our hemp. This is with the uh, Japanese field decorticator. So in order to get from that tall, looks like bamboo, into something that you can use for fabric, you gotta run it through this decorticator, which is this, you know, basically very violent machine that takes and separates the herd from the, from the fiber. And uh, so this is us working on it. And this is where we purchased our equipment in China. And this is my uh, cousin, Neil LaDuc, um, having raised tech with some hemp. And uh, that's what he's doing here, doing his best, and um, I just wanna say, this is who gets a lot of the work done, all kind of people up here. So a little bit more about, you know, what we understand from hemp. This is, um, well here first, I'm gonna show you, this is what, this is what we ended up with in our field. This is hemp fiber that we ran through the decorticator. And uh, in that, um, what we're after is fiber and you can see, so you can grow the same amount of fiber as you can if you grew, you know, had a forest in those acres, except for this four times as much fiber and it only grows in a year instead of 20 years. So that is why you want hemp in the fiber business. And that is why you want hemp in the paper and the wood business is because it grows so much faster. And also as you will learn in the class, it uh, is a carbon sink. The other thing, um, you know, you can, you can see it here, but it also will turn into this fabric. And so cotton, the reason that I'm super interested in, in hemp, this is the hemp cotton or the hemp textile here, is that cotton, which is what, you know, most of us try to wear our clothes out of, if you aren't totally drowning yourself in fossil fuel polyesters, cotton takes four times as much water and uh, needs a lot of land and uses incredible amount of pesticides. They say that, that cotton is 4% of the world's agriculture, but 25% of the world's pesticides. So well, if we could just move along and be hemp. See, here's another fa fabulous, this is a little bit kind of sacred. These are all patches we have at one of us hemp. All right, so, oh my gosh, here's hemp wood. These guys are so interesting. These guys are taking hemp, you can see the green in there. They're just taking hemp entirely without the, without the seeds on it, laying down these 10 foot high stalks and squishing them with some soybean paste. I don't really know, it's like kind of magical, but it's a lot of pressure and some baking. And they're making very, 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 very strong wood. And we're gonna have an entire class on hemp and construction to share that information and uh, super interesting. And then um, hemp for building materials. And here are some of the building materials you can make of hemp. And so, you know, in the world we live in, you got to house people and you got to make new construction. And, and, you know, we will talk about it later, but, you know, let us just be honest, enough with the concrete, time to move on. And this stuff, you know, from, from structurally derived hemp, we're going to have some classes that discuss that to hemp insulation. See this here, 
is our hemp insulation. See this here? And we put this in our farm and our south and our garage. We insulate it in this stuff. Do you see how I'm putting it up my face? You can do that with fiberglass. This is like 98% hemp. And then I don't know, it's got some other magical stuff in it. But this, I believe, is very important for Indian country because uh, we need that. We need to be able to uh, we need to be able to build for our people. And then um, there's a hemp bottle, you know, biodegrades too. The question really becomes, do you need single use bottles? So all this containers, it's great. You can make them all at hemp, but maybe you should just kind of like, just carry a water bottle or something. Anyway, so this is kind of the examples of hemp. And then, uh, oh wait here, before I show this picture, this is our hemp pasta. Let's see, I'll show this here. I believe that these are called uh, these rigatonis or rotinis. This is hemp pasta. And this is hemp hearts, all squished up. And you can make hemp pasta out of it. Now, this photo up here is, of course, for those of you who do not yet know, this is uh, Marcella Gilbert and um, Madonna Thunderbolt. I was raised with these women. I worked for Madonna as a young woman. And a few years ago, I just like sending this picture. I sent them some hemp seeds. They asked me for some so they could grow them out on the Cheyenne River Reservation because they're both rancher girls. And then I asked them to send me a picture of them in their hemp and they sent me this. So that's to say that hemp also makes people happy. It's great, you know, for your demeanor. And here's another picture and uh, of my friend Sherilyn Spears with some hemp that she, this was her first year and Red Lake is, uh, she's the Red Lake Nation's hemp project person. And she's gonna be growing out even more hemp this upcoming year. And so I just wanna say that, you know, I'm not the only woman up North here who's growing hemp. There's all kinds of people that are growing hemp. And this class is really to encourage us all to do our best. So let me see what else we got here. Oh, and then here's a little bit more about the potential for hemp in terms of fiber. Now I showed you this here, right? And then um, I showed you uh, this here, but that there that you're looking at is, you know, I've been following all of these threads. We'll call them threads to try to figure out how to make hemp, you know, across this country. And I went to all these workshops and, oh my word, I see all kind of fancy equipment and this one's got it and this one's got it. There's nobody who's making hemp fabric in North America. Wait, let me just say that one more time. There's nobody making hemp fabric in North America as of today. However, by the end of the year, there might be. And in the meantime, there's two different things that you that is really important to think about. So this here is hemp long fiber. I don't know if you can see this, but this is long fiber hemp, right? Now, this is what you can make rope out of, and you can see the rope there, and you can also make Navajo textiles out of it. Mm -hmm. Now, hemp very short fiber. Oh my gosh, that is this here. Very short, like this long, is what you make clothing like this out of. It's, and this has got to be degummed to make this. And so that is the question in the technology that we are learning about. Degumming, there is hemp fabric that is certainly made, but it is made in China and elsewhere. And most of it is using a lot of caustic things to degum and process. Uh, we are interested in how you can do that, how you did that before the advent of caustic chemicals, how you did it for 10,000 years and made all those sales without the use of caustic chemicals. That's the interest that we have here. And that's our work in Minnesota. This is hemp fiber made by Danae Weavers. I uh, had Ira Vandever. He's going to come up and teach some of this class with me. But Ira Vandenver came and visited and then he asked me for some hemp fiber. I sent that back and he sent me back pictures of rugs. And then he sent me back pictures of a box made of hemp wool uh, fabrics, uh, fibers by uh, Navajo artisans. And so, you know, this is just the beginning. This is the high end artisan hemp work, um, obviously. And then there's the much more materials economy hemp work, but all of this is our potential. And, you know, in order to do that, as tribal people, that's why I'm here, is you gotta figure out how to grow it. You gotta figure out where your seeds are coming from. You gotta figure out how to harvest it. You gotta figure out how to process it. You gotta figure out what your tribal regulations are. And then you gotta figure out what you're gonna do with it because it is a really wide array of potentially, you know, really incredible opportunities. The other thing is, is that hemp is very good at carbon sequestration. 
And that's because, you know, in some of the earlier slides I was showing you, like it grows so fast, grows like a weed, you know, so it'll grow like six, eight, 10 feet, like over the course of a summer. And when it goes up like this, it has to pull down all this carbon from the air that goes into the plant that's called carbon sequestration. And hemp is one of the highest rates of carbon sequestration of any plant. And so that in itself is really one of the most beautiful things about this plant at this point in time, when what we need to do is to get the carbon out of the air. Now, you know, the crazy guys over there at the federal government and the industry, the Windigo economy guys, they want to have carbon uh, pipelines where they want to take the carbon from polluting devices and then go take the carbon through a very expensive pipeline back and put it in some coal strip mine in, in Pennsylvania or some other location where they believe that they can put this carbon, in, which all sounds like pretty crazy and dangerous when in fact you could just grow hemp and you would have the same result. Oh, but much better with a lot less conflict. I already said something about hemp building materials. I think I showed this picture. And then here's some things about hemp harvesting that we're trying to figure out. This is hemp harvesting. Like back in the day, here's some horses. I'm kind of looking at that equipment, but it's all super labor intensive. And then here's hemp harvesting in France in September, uh, you know, 2007. You know, so looking at all of these technologies. Now, a lot of tribes are looking at hemp and what would be really great is if we can figure out some of the best ways to process hemp and the best ways to harvest it. You know, and then here is the, the other parts of the hemp economy. Uh, this is really my very cool Christmas card from Alibaba from where I bought the hemp decorticator in China. Now, why am I showing you this photo? Because everything basically you make in hemp equipment and almost all of the value added processing for a lot of our materials economy is made in China by these beautiful, awesome young women and a few men that are in this picture. My point is, is that if you got the biggest potential for the hemp economy in North America, you might want to figure out how to make some equipment here. You might want to figure out how to, how to relocalize our economies so that Indian people, you know, not only own the land, own the value added processing, uh, that we own the value added processing and we own the equipment. So to me, the hemp economy represents a brand new economy. Wait, let me say that. I call it the new green revolution. That's what we call it, the new green revolution, because of the tremendous potential, because it's an actually unrealized economy in North America. Billions of dollars worth of unrealized potential just coming to life now. And Indian people, indigenous people, we don't want to be on the menu. We want to be at the table. We don't want white guys on our reservation, leased land, growing hemp for this economy. We want to be the ones growing the hemp in our reservation territory and beyond. And, you know, as we think about the implications for change, both in terms of the massive potential of this economically in the materials economy and carbon sequestration, we also want to talk about you know, how revolutionary it is. And I refer to this, as I said, as the new green revolution. And why I do that is because you know, the University of Minnesota was the foundation of what's called the green revolution. There was a guy there named Norman Borlaug at the University of Minnesota Ag School who came up with all of these ideas along with some of his other fabulous white guy colleagues to go out there and have a whole bunch of fossil fuels and a whole bunch of mechanized agriculture and a whole bunch of seeds that were standardized. Industrialized agriculture is what we know it as. It's not conventional agriculture, it's industrialized. And those guys went out there and got all this stuff and then they figured out how to ship it around the world and they called it the green revolution. And so today, you know, the genetically modified organisms, the genetically modified seeds, the concentration of the ownership of seeds by corporations like Monsanto and Syngenta, the taking of lands from indigenous peoples for big agribusiness, that's the green revolution. That's Norman Borlaug, the University of Minnesota's Green Revolution. And so I feel like it's time for the new Green Revolution. And that could be right here from Minnesota too. Indigenous people could lead it and we should all be at the table because it's not one. We all, if we're gonna change the world, we're gonna work together. So I call this the new Green Revolution. I'm asking you to join me, join our class. And here I am, you know, here on our farm. My hero, my hero here, Alex White Plume and Mato, his grandson, all here for the hemp. This was uh, uh, last year. He came up on a nice day before the crazy of everything else was going on and around me and had a nice day and looked out at our hemp. 
And this is some of the first people that I met in the hemp conference. Of course, my eyes are closed in this picture, but this is the first NOCO hemp conference. That was about five years ago that I went to. And look at all those Indian people just getting ready to get going on hemp. And, um, you know, I feel like the future is green and the potential is great. And this class is really about answering some of those questions and encouraging people and getting them started. So I'm going to um, here is uh, for technical support. You can, of course, get a hold of Lucille at anishinaabeagriculture.com. Here's our course website. Your materials are all on Moogle. Moodle, that's what it's called. It's got like all your curriculum and your special classes and your special additional materials. We are going to have some questionnaires to help you guide your learning to make sure you get the basic concepts down from us. And then Really, we just wanted to do, hoping you can get a couple of research papers out of folks. Class is uh, pass-fail, as I said, and it's really up to you how much you want to get out of it. And, um, you know, what I want to say is thank you for joining me today in the first HEMP class, HEMP 101. Um, you know, we're going to do our best to provide you as much information as possible. And uh, we welcome you to the new Green Revolution, HEMP 101, and hope that between this class and maybe some of you are coming to our hemp conference, or you will come see us on the farm, but we will all work together to make a good future for our children. Miigwech. This is Winona LaDuke. <laughs>